section thirty two of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli introducers of exotic flowers fruits etc there has been a class of men whose patriotic affection or whose general benevolence have been usually defrauded of the gratitude their country owes them these have been the introducers of new flowers new plants and new roots into europe the greater part which we now enjoy was drawn from the luxuriant climates of asia and the profusion which now covers our land originated in the most anxious nursing and were the gifts of individuals monuments are reared and medals struck to commemorate events and names which are less deserving our regard than those who have transplanted into the colder gardens of the north the rich fruits the beautiful flowers and the succulent pulse and roots of more favoured spots and carrying into their own country as it were another nature they have as old gerard well expresses it laboured with the soil to make it fit for the plants and with the plants to make them delight in the soil there is no part of the characters of pierresque and evelyn accomplished as they are in so many which seems more delightful to me than their enthusiasm for the garden the orchard and the forest pierresque whose literary occupations admitted of no interruption and whose universal correspondence throughout the habitable globe was more than sufficient to absorb his studious life yet was the first man as gassendus relates in his interesting manner whose incessant inquiries procured a great variety of jessamines those from china whose leaves always green bear a clay-coloured flower and a delicate perfume the american with a crimson coloured and the persian with a violet-coloured flower and the arabian whose tendrils he delighted to train over the banqueting house in his garden and of fruits the orange trees with a red and party-coloured flower the medlar the rough cherry without stone the rare and luxurious vines of smyrna and damascus and the fig-tree called adams whose fruit by its size was conjectured to be that with which the spies returned from the land of canaan gassendus describes the transports of pieresque when the sage beheld the indian ginger growing green in his garden and his delight in grafting the myrtle on the musk vine that the experiment might show us the myrtle wine of the ancients but transplanters like other inventors are sometimes baffled in their delightful enterprises and we are told of pieresque's deep regret when he found that the indian cocoa-nut would only bud and then perish in the cold air of france while the leaves of the egyptian papyrus refused to yield him their vegetable paper but it was his garden which propagated the exotic fruits and flowers which he transplanted into the french kings and into cardinal barberini's and the curious in europe and these occasioned a work on the manuring of flowers by ferrarius a botanical jesuit who there described these novelties to europe had evelyn only composed the great work of his silva or a discourse of forest trees his name would have excited the gratitude of posterity the voice of the patriot exalts in the dedication to charles the second prefixed to one of the later editions i need not acquaint your majesty how many millions of timber trees besides infinite others have been propagated and planted throughout your vast dominions at the instigation and by the sole direction of this work because your majesty has been pleased to own it publicly for my encouragement and surely while britain retains her awful situation among the nations of europe the silva of evelyn will endure with her triumphant oaks it was a retired philosopher who aroused the genius of the nation and who casting a prophetic eye towards the age in which we live contributed to secure our sovereignty of the seas the present navy of great britain has been constructed with the oaks which the genius of evelyn planted 
animated by a zeal truly patriotic de serre in france fifteen ninety nine composed a work on the art of raising silkworms and dedicated it to the municipal body of paris to excite the inhabitants to cultivate mulberry trees the work at first produced a strong sensation and many planted mulberry trees in the vicinity of paris but as they were not yet used to raise and manage the silkworm they reaped nothing but their trouble for their pains they tore up the mulberry trees they had planted and in spite of de serre asserted that the northern climate was not adapted for the rearing of that tender insect the great sully from his hatred of all objects of luxury countenanced the popular clamour and crushed the rising enterprise of de serre the monarch was wiser than the minister the book had made sufficient noise to reach the ear of henry the fourth who desired the author to draw up a memoir on the subject from which the king was induced to plant mulberry trees in all the royal gardens and having imported the eggs of silkworms from spain this patriotic monarch gave up his orangeries which he considered but as his private gratification for that leaf which converted into silk became a part of the national wealth it is to de serre who introduced the plantations of mulberry trees that the commerce of france owes one of her staple commodities and although the patriot encountered the hostility of the prime minister and the hasty prejudices of the populace in his own day yet his name at this moment is fresh in the hearts of his fellow-citizens for i have just received a medal the gift of a literary friend from paris which bears his portrait with the reverse societe de agriculture du département de la seine it was struck in eighteen o seven the same honour is the right of evelyn from the british nation there was a period when the spirit of plantation was prevalent in this kingdom it probably originated from the ravages of the soldiery during the civil wars a man whose retired modesty has perhaps obscured his claims on our regard the intimate friend of the great spirits of that age by birth a pole but whose mother had probably been an englishwoman samuel hartlib to whom milton addressed his tract on education published every manuscript he collected on the subjects of horticulture and agriculture the public good he effected attracted the notice of cromwell who rewarded him with a pension which after the restoration of charles the second was suffered to lapse and hartlib died in utter neglect and poverty one of his tracts is a design for plenty by an universal planting of fruit trees the project consisted in enclosing the waste lands and commons and appointing officers whom he calls fruiterers or wood wards to see the plantations were duly attended to the writer of this project observes on fruits that it is a sort of provision so natural to the taste that the poor man and even the child will prefer it before better food as the story goeth which he has preserved in these ancient and simple lines the poor man's child invited was to dine with flesh of oxen sheep and fatted swine far better cheer than he at home could find and yet this child to stay had little mind you have quoth he no apple foise nor pie stewed pears with bread and milk and walnuts by the enthusiasm of these transplanters inspired their labours they have watched the tender infant of their planting till the leaf and the flowers and the fruit expanded under their hand often indeed they have ameliorated the quality increased the size and even created a new species the apricot drawn from america was first known in europe in the sixteenth century an old french writer has remarked that it was originally not larger than a damson our gardeners he says have improved it to the perfection of its present size and richness one of these enthusiasts is noticed by evelyn who for forty years had in vain tried by a graft to bequeath his name to a new fruit but persisting on wrong principles this votary of pomona has died without a name 
we sympathize with sir william temple when he exultingly acquaints us with the size of his orange-trees and with the flavour of his peaches and grapes confessed by frenchmen to have equalled those of fontainebleau and gascony while the italians agreed that his white figs were as good as any of that sort in italy and of his having had the honour to naturalise in this country four kinds of grapes with his liberal distributions of cuttings from them because he ever thought all things of this kind the commoner they are the better the greater number of our exotic flowers and fruits were carefully transported into this country by many of our travelled nobility and gentry footnote alexander netcham abbot of Cirencester, born eleven fifty seven died twelve seventeen has left us his idea of a noble garden which should contain roses lilies sunflowers violets poppies and the narcissus a large variety of roses were introduced between the fourteenth and sixteenth centuries the provence rose is thought to have been introduced by margaret of anjou wife to henry the sixth the periwinkle was common in mediaeval gardens and so was the gillyflower or clove pink the late mr hudson turner contributed an interesting paper on the state of horticulture in england in early times to the fifth volume of the archaeological journal among other things he notes the contents of the earl of lincoln's garden in holborn from the bailiff's account in the twenty-fourth year of edward i we learn from this curious document that apples pears nuts and cherries were produced in sufficient quantities not only to supply the earl's table but also to yield a profit by their sale the vegetables cultivated in this garden were beans onions garlic leeks and others vines were also grown and their cuttings sold End of footnote. some names have been casually preserved the learned Lenacre first brought, on his return from Italy, the damask rose, and Thomas Lord Cornwall, in the reign of Henry the Eighth, enriched our fruit gardens with three different plums. In the reign of Elizabeth, Edward Grindal, afterwards Archbishop of Canterbury, returning from exile, transported here the medicinal plant of the tamarisk. The first oranges appear to have been brought into England by one of the Carey family, for a century after they still flourished at the family seat at beddington in surrey the cherry orchards of kent were first planted about sittingbourne by a gardener of henry the eighth and the currant bush was transplanted when our commerce with the island of zante was first opened in the same reign the elder tradescant in sixteen twenty entered himself on board of a privateer armed against morocco solely with a view of finding an opportunity of stealing apricots into britain and it appears that he succeeded in his design to sir walter raleigh we have not been indebted solely for the luxury of the tobacco plant but for that infinitely useful root which forms a part of our daily meal and often the entire meal of the poor man the potato which deserved to have been called a raleigh sir anthony ashley of winburn st giles dorsetshire first planted cabbages in this country and a cabbage at his feet appears on his monument before his time we had them from holland sir richard weston first brought clover grass into england from flanders in sixteen forty five and the figs planted by cardinal pole at lambeth so far back as the reign of henry the eighth are said to be still remaining there nor is this surprising for spilman who set up the first paper mill in england at dartford in fifteen ninety is said to have brought over in his portmanteau the two first lime trees which he planted here and which are still growing the lombardy poplar was introduced into england by the earl of rochford in seventeen fifty eight the first mulberry trees in this country are now standing at sion house by an harleian manuscript six eight eight four we find that the first general planting of mulberries and making of silk in england was by william stallinge comptroller of the custom house and m verton in sixteen o eight it is probable that m verton transplanted this novelty from his own country where we have seen de serre's great attempt here the mulberries have succeeded better than the silkworms 
the very names of many of our vegetable kingdom indicate their locality from the majestic cedar of lebanon to the small coal lettuce which came from the island of co the cherries from Cherasuntis, a city of pontus the peach or parasicum or malapersica persian apples from persia the pistachio or pistachia is the syrian word for that nut the chestnut or chatagne in french and the castagna in italian from castagna a town of magnesia are plums coming chiefly from syria and damascus the damson or damascene plum reminds us of its distant origin it is somewhat curious to observe on this subject that there exists an unsuspected intercourse between nations in the propagation of exotic plants lucullus after the war with mithridates introduced cherries from pontus into italy and the newly imported fruit was found so pleasing that it was rapidly propagated and six-and-twenty years afterwards pliny testifies the cherry-tree passed over into britain thus a victory obtained by a roman consul over a king of pontus with which it would seem that britain could not have the remotest interest was the real occasion of our countrymen possessing cherry orchards yet to our shame must it be told that these cherries from the king of pontus's city of cherosuntis are not the cherries we are now eating for the whole race of cherry trees was lost in the saxon period and was only restored by the gardener of henry the eighth who brought them from flanders without a word to enhance his own merits concerning the bellum mithridaticum a calculating political economist will little sympathize with the peaceful triumphs of those active and generous spirits who have thus propagated the truest wealth and the most innocent luxuries of the people the project of a new tax or an additional consumption of ardent spirits or an act of parliament to put a convenient stop to population by forbidding the bands of some happy couple would be more congenial to their researches and they would leave without regret the names of those whom we have held out to the grateful recollections of their country the romans who with all their errors were at least patriots entertained very different notions of these introducers into their country of exotic fruits and flowers sir william temple has elegantly noticed the fact the great captains and even consular men who first brought them over took pride in giving them their own names by which they ran a great while in rome as in memory of some great service or pleasure they had done their country so that not only laws and battles but several sorts of apples and pears were called manlian and claudian pompeian and tiberian and by several other such noble names pliny has paid his tribute of applause to lucullus for bringing cherry and nut trees from pontus into italy and we have several modern instances where the name of the transplanter or rearer has been preserved in this sort of creation peter collinson the botanist to whom the english gardens are indebted for many new and curious species which he acquired by means of an extensive correspondence in america was highly gratified when linnaeus baptized a plant with his name and with great spirit asserts his honourable claim something i think was due to me for the great number of plants and seeds i have annually procured from abroad and you have been so good as to pay it by giving me a species of eternity botanically speaking that is a name as long as men and books endure such is the true animating language of these patriotic enthusiasts some lines at the close of peacham's emblems give an idea of an english fruit garden in sixteen twelve he mentions that cherries were not long known and gives an origin to the name of filbert footnote this is however an error mr turner in the paper quoted page one fifty four says it may fairly be presumed that the cherry was well known at the period of the conquest and at every subsequent time it is mentioned by netcham in the twelfth century and was cultivated in the earl of lincoln's garden in the thirteenth end of footnote the persian peach and fruitful quince and there the forward almond grew with cherries known no longer time since the winter warden orchard's pride the filibert that loves the vale and red queen apple so envied 
of schoolboys passing by the pale footnotes the quince comes from sidon a town of crete we are told by le grand in his vie privée de francois volume one page one hundred and forty three where may be found a list of the origin of most of our fruits peachum has here given a note the filbert so named of philibert a king of france who caused by art sundry kinds to be brought forth as did a gardener of otranto in italy by clogilly flowers and carnations of such colours as we now see them the queen apple was probably thus distinguished in compliment to elizabeth in moffat's health's improvement i find an account of apples which are said to have been grafted upon a mulberry stock and then wax thorough red as our queen apples called by ruellius rubelliana and claudiana by pliny i am told the race is not extinct but though an apple of this description may yet be found it seems to have sadly degenerated end of footnotes end of section thirty two section thirty three of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli usurers of the seventeenth century a person whose history will serve as a canvas to exhibit some scenes of the arts of the money trader was one audley a lawyer and a great practical philosopher who concentrated his vigorous faculties in the science of the relative value of money he flourished through the reigns of james i charles i and held a lucrative office in the court of wards till that singular court was abolished at the time of the restoration footnote the court of wards was founded in the right accorded to the king from the earliest time to act as guardian to all minors who were the children of his own tenants or of those who did the sovereign knightly service they were in the same position consequently as the chancery wards of the present day but much complaint being made of the private management of themselves and their estates by the persons who acted as their guardians and who were responsible only to the king's exchequer king henry the eighth in the thirty-second year of his reign founded the court of wards in westminster hall as an open court of trial or appeal for all persons under its jurisdiction in the following year a court of liveries was added to it and it was always afterwards known as the court of wards and liveries by liveries is meant in old legal phraseology the delivery of session to the heir of the king's tenant in ward upon suing for it at full age the investiture in fact of the ward in his legal right as heir to his parents property this court was under the conduct of a very few officers who enriched themselves and one of the first acts of the house of lords when the great changes were made during the troubles of charles i was to suppress the court altogether this was done in sixteen forty five and confirmed by cromwell in sixteen fifty six at the restoration of charles the second it was again specially noted as entirely suppressed End of footnote in his own times he was called the great audley an epithet so often abused and here applied to the creation of enormous wealth but there are minds of great capacity concealed by the nature of their pursuits and the wealth of audley may be considered as the cloudy medium through which a bright genius shone and which had it been thrown into a nobler sphere of action the greatness would have been less ambiguous audley lived at a time when divines were proclaiming the detestable sin of usury prohibited by god and man but the mosaic prohibition was the municipal law of an agricultural commonwealth 
which being without trade the general poverty of its members could afford no interest for loans but it was not forbidden the israelite to take usury from the stranger or they were quoting from the fathers who understood this point much as they had that of original sin and the immaculate conception while the scholastics amused themselves with a quaint and collegiate fancy which they had picked up in aristotle that interest for money had been forbidden by nature because coin in itself was barren and unpropagating unlike corn of which every grain will produce many but audley considered no doubt that money was not incapable of multiplying itself provided it was in hands which knew to make it grow and breed as shylock affirmed the lawyers then however did not agree with the divines nor the college philosophers they were straining at a more liberal interpretation of this odious term usury lord bacon declared that the suppression of usury is only fit for an utopian government and audley must have agreed with the learned cowell who in his interpreter derives the term abusu et iri quasi usu ira which in our vernacular style was corrupted into usury whatever the sin might be in the eye of some it had become at least a controversial sin as sir simon's dues calls it in his manuscript diary who however was afraid to commit it footnote dues father lost a manor which was recovered by the widow of the person who had sold it to him old dues considered this loss as a punishment for the usurious loan of money the fact is that he had purchased that manor with the interests accumulating from the money lent on it his son entreated him to give over the practice of that controversial sin this expression shows that even in that age there were rational political economists jeremy bentham in his little treatise on usury offers just views cleared from the indistinct and partial ones so long prevalent jeremy collier has an admirable essay on usury volume three it is a curious notion of lord bacon that he would have interest at a lower rate in the country than in trading towns because the merchant is best able to afford the highest End of footnote. audley no doubt considered that interest was nothing more than rent for money as rent was no better than usury for land the legal interest was then ten in the hundred but the thirty the fifty and the hundred for the hundred the grip of usury and the shameless contrivances of the money traders these he would attribute to the follies of others or to his own genius this sage on the wealth of nations with his pithy wisdom and quaint sagacity began with two hundred pounds and lived to view his mortgages his statutes and his judgments so numerous that it was observed his papers would have made a good map of england a contemporary dramatist who copied from life has opened the chamber of such an usurer perhaps of our audley here lay a manor bound fast in a skin of parchment the wax continuing hard the acres melting here a sure deed of gift for a market town if not redeemed this day which is not in the unthrift's power there being scarce one shire in wales or england where my monies are not lent out at usury the certain hook to draw in more massengers city madam this genius of thirty per cent first had proved the decided vigour of his mind by his enthusiastic devotion to his law studies deprived of the leisure for study through his busy day he stole the hours from his late nights and his early mornings and without the means to procure a law library he invented a method to possess one without the cost as far as he learned he taught and by publishing some useful tracts on temporary occasions he was enabled to purchase a library he appears never to have read a book without its furnishing him with some new practical design and he probably studied too much for his own particular advantage such devoted studies was the way to become a lord chancellor but the science of the law was here subordinate to that of a money-trader 
when yet but a clerk to the clerk in the counter frequent opportunities occurred which audley knew how to improve he became a money trader as he had become a law writer and the fears and follies of mankind were to furnish him with a trading capital the fertility of his genius appeared in expedients and in quick contrivances he was sure to be the friend of all men falling out he took a deep concern in the affairs of his master's clients and often much more than they were aware of no man so ready at procuring bail or compounding debts this was a considerable traffic then as now they hired themselves out for bail swore what was required and contrived to give false addresses which is now called leg bail they dressed themselves out for the occasion a great seal ring flamed on the finger which however was pure copper gilt and they often assumed the name of some person of good credit savings and small presents for gratuitous opinions often afterwards discovered to be very fallacious ones enabled him to purchase annuities of easy landowners with their treble amount secured on their estates the improvident owners or the careless heirs were soon entangled in the usurer's nets and after the receipt of a few years the annuity by some latent quibble or some irregularity in the payments usually ended in audley's obtaining the treble forfeiture he could at all times out knave a knave one of these incidents has been preserved a draper of no honest reputation being arrested by a merchant for a debt of two hundred pounds audley bought the debt at forty pounds for which the draper immediately offered him fifty pounds but audley would not consent unless the draper indulged a sudden whim of his own this was a formal contract that the draper should pay within twenty years upon twenty certain days a penny doubled a knave in haste to sign is no calculator and as the contemporary dramatist describes one of the arts of those citizens one part of whose business was to swear and break they all grow rich by breaking the draper eagerly compounded he afterwards grew rich audley silently watching his victim within two years claims his doubled pennies every month during twenty months the pennies had now grown up to pounds the knave perceived the trick and preferred paying the forfeiture of his bond for five hundred pounds rather than to receive the visitation of all the little generation of compound interest in the last descendant of two thousand pounds which would have closed with the draper's shop the inventive genius of audley might have illustrated that popular tract of his own times peacham's worth of a penny a gentleman who having scarcely one left consoled himself by detailing the numerous comforts of life it might procure in the days of charles the second such petty enterprises at length assumed a deeper cast of interest he formed temporally partnerships with the stewards of country gentlemen they underlet estates which they had to manage and anticipating the owner's necessities the estates in due time became cheap purchases for audley and the stewards he usually contrived to make the wood pay for the land which he called making the feathers pay for the goose he had however such a tenderness of conscience for his victim that having plucked the live feathers before he sent the unfledged goose on the common he would bestow a gratuitous lecture in his own science teaching the art of making them grow again by showing how to raise the remaining rents audley thus made the tenant furnish at once the means to satisfy his own rapacity and his employer's necessities his avarice was not working by a blind but on an enlightened principle for he was only enabling the landlord to obtain what the tenant with due industry could afford to give adam smith might have delivered himself in the language of old audley so just was his standard of the value of rents under an easy landlord said audley a tenant seldom thrives contenting himself to make the just measure of his rents and not labouring for any surplusage of estate under a hard one the tenant revenges himself upon the land and runs away with the rent i would raise my rents to the present price of all commodities for if we should let our lands as other men have done before us now other wares daily go on in price 
we should fall backward in our estates these axioms of political economy were discoveries in his day audley knew mankind practically and struck into their humours with the versatility of genius oracularly deep with the grave he only stung the lighter mind when a lord borrowing money complained to audley of his exactions his lordship exclaimed what do you not intend to use a conscience yes i intend hereafter to use it we moneyed people must balance accounts if you do not pay me you cheat me but if you do then i cheat your lordship audley's moneyed conscience balanced the risk of his lordship's honour against the probability of his own rapacious profits when he resided in the temple among those pullets without feathers as an old writer describes the brood the good man would pule out paternal homilies on improvident youth grieving that they under pretence of learning the law only learnt to be lawless and never knew by their own studies the process of an execution till it was served on themselves nor could he fail in his prophecy for at the moment that the stoic was enduring their ridicule his agents were supplying them with the certain means of verifying it it is quaintly said he had his decoying as well as his decaying gentlemen the arts practised by the money traders of that time have been detailed by one of the town satirists of the age decker in his english villainies has told the story we may observe how an old story contains many incidents which may be discovered in a modern one the artifice of covering the usury by a pretended purchase and sale of certain wares even now practised was then at its height in measure for measure we find here's young master rash he's in for a commodity of brown paper and old ginger nine score and seventeen pounds of which he made five marks ready money the eager gull for his immediate wants takes at an immense price any goods on credit which he immediately resells for less than half the cost and when dispatch presses the vendor and the purchaser have been the same person and the brown paper and old ginger merely nominal footnote in rowley's search for money sixteen o nine is an amusing description of the usurer who binds his clients in worse bonds and manacles than the turks galley slaves and in decker's knight's conjuring sixteen o seven we read of another who cozened young gentlemen of their land had acres mortgaged to him by wiseacres for three hundred pounds paid in hobby-horses dogs bells and lute-strings which if they had been sold by the drum or at an outcrop public auction with the cry of no man better would never have yielded fifty pounds in the footnote the whole displays a complete system of dupery and the agents were graduated the manner of undoing gentlemen by taking up of commodities is the title of a chapter in english villainies the warren is the cant term which describes the whole party but this requires a word of explanation it is probable that rabbit warrens were numerous about the metropolis a circumstance which must have multiplied the poachers moffat who wrote on diet in the reign of elizabeth notices their plentiful supply for the poor's maintenance i cannot otherwise account for the appellatives given to sharpers and the terms of cheatery being so familiarly drawn from a rabbit warren not that even in that day these cant terms travel far out of their own circle for robert green mentions a trial in which the judges good simple men imagined that the coney catcher at the bar was a warrener or one who had the care of a warren the cant term of warren included the young conies or half-ruined prodigals of that day with the younger brothers who had accomplished their ruin these naturally herded together as the pigeon and the black leg of the present day the coney catchers were those who raised a trade on their necessities to be coney catched was to be cheated the warren forms a combination altogether to attract some novice who in esse or in posse has his present means good and those to come great 
he is very glad to learn how money can be raised the warren seek after a tumbler a sort of hunting dog and the nature of a london tumbler was to hunt dry foot in this manner the tumbler is let loose and runs snuffing up and down in the shops of mercers goldsmiths drapers haberdashers to meet with a ferret that is a citizen who is ready to sell a commodity the tumbler in his first course usually returned in despair pretending to have outwearied himself by hunting and swears that the city ferrets are so coped that is have their lips stitched up close that he can't get them to open to so great a sum as five hundred pounds which the warren wants this herb being chewed down by the rabbit suckers almost kills their hearts it irritates their appetite and they keenly bid the tumbler if he can't fasten on plate or cloth or silks to lay hold of brown paper bartholomew babies lute strings or hobnails it hath been verily reported says decker that one gentleman of great hopes took up a hundred pounds in hobby horses and sold them for thirty pounds and sixteen pounds in joints of mutton and quarters of lamb ready roasted and sold them for three pounds such commodities were called purse nets the tumbler on his second hunt trots up and down again and at last lights on a ferret that will deal the names are given in to a scrivener who inquires whether they are good men and finds four out of the five are wind-shaken but the fifth is an oak that can bear the hewing bonds are sealed commodities delivered and the tumbler fetches his second career and their credit having obtained the purse nets the wares must now obtain money the tumbler now hunts for the rabbit suckers those who buy these purse nets but the rabbit suckers seem greater devils than the ferrets for they always bid under and after many exclamations the warren is glad that the seller should repurchase his own commodities for ready money at thirty or fifty per cent under the cost the story does not finish till we come to the manner how the warren is spoiled i shall transcribe this part of the narrative in the lively style of this town writer while there is any grass to nibble upon the rabbits are there but on the cold day of repayment they retire into their caves so that when the ferret makes a count of five in chase four disappear then he grows fierce and tears open his own jaws to suck blood from him that is left sergeants marshal men and bailiffs are sent forth who lie scenting at every corner and with terrible paws haunt every walk the bird is seized upon by these hawks his estate looked into his wings broken his lands made over to a stranger he pays five hundred pounds who never had but sixty pounds or to prison or he seals any bond mortgages any lordship does anything yields anything a little way in he cares not how far he wades the greater his possessions are the apter he is to take up and to be trusted thus gentlemen are ferreted and undone it is evident that the whole system turns on the single novice those who join him in his bonds are stalking horses the whole was to begin and to end with the single individual the great coney of the warren such was the nature of those commodities to which massinger and shakespeare allude and which the modern dramatist may exhibit in his comedy and be still sketching after life another scene closely connected with the present will complete the picture the ordinaries of those days were the lounging places of the men of the town and the fantastic gallants who herded together Footnote the meeting of gallants at an ordinary or the walks in pals sixteen o three is the title of a rare tract in the malone collection now in the bodleian library it is a curious picture of the manners of the day End of footnote. ordinaries were the exchange for news the echoing places for all sorts of town talk there they might hear of the last new play and poem and the last fresh widow who was sighing for some night to make her a lady these resorts were attended also to save charges of housekeeping 
the reign of james i is characterized by all the wantonness of prodigality among one class and all the penuriousness and rapacity in another which met in the dissolute indolence of a peace of twenty years but a more striking feature in these ordinaries showed itself as soon as the voider had cleared the table then began the shuffling and cutting on one side and the bones rattling on the other the ordinary in fact was a gambling-house like those now expressively termed hells and i doubt if the present infernos exceed the whole diablerie of our ancestors in the former scene of sharping they derive their cant terms from a rabbit warren but in the present their allusions partly relate to an aviary and truly the proverb suited them of birds of a feather those who first propose to sit down to play are called the leaders the ruined gamesters are the forlorn hope the great winner is the eagle a stander-by who encourages by little ventures himself the freshly imported gallant who is called the gull is the woodpecker and a monstrous bird of prey who is always hovering round the table is the gull groper who at a pinch is the benevolent audley of the ordinary there was besides one other character of an original cast apparently the friend of none of the party and yet in fact the atlas which supported the ordinary on his shoulders he was sometimes significantly called the impostor the gull is a young man whose father a citizen or a squire just dead leaves him ten or twelve thousand pounds in ready money besides some hundreds a year scouts are sent out and lie in ambush for him they discover what apothecary shop he resorts to every morning or in what tobacco shop in fleet street he takes a pipe of smoke in the afternoon the usual resorts of the loungers of that day some sharp wit of the ordinary a pleasant fellow whom robert green calls the taker up one of universal conversation lures the heir of seven hundred a year to the ordinary a gull sets the whole aviary in spirits and decker well describes the flutter of joy and expectation the leaders maintain themselves brave the forlorn hope that drooped before doth now gallantly come on the eagle feathers his nest the woodpecker picks up the crumbs the gull groper grows fat with good feeding and the gull himself at whom every one has a pull hath in the inn scarce feathers to keep his back warm during the gull's progress through primero and gleek he wants for no admirable advice and solemn warnings from two excellent friends the gull groper and at length the impostor footnote games with cards strutt says primero is one of the most ancient games known to have been played in england and he thus describes it each player had four cards dealt to him the seven was the highest card in point of number that he could avail himself of which counted for twenty-one the six counted for sixteen the five for fifteen and the ace for the same but the two the three and the four for their respective points only the knave of hearts was commonly fixed upon for the quinola which the player might make what card or suit he thought proper if the cards were of different suits the highest number won the primero if they were all of one colour he that held them won the flush gleek is described in memoirs of gamesters seventeen fourteen as a game on the cards wherein the ace is called tib the knave tom the four of trump's Tiddy. tib the ace is fifteen in hand and eighteen in play because it wins a trick tom the knave is nine and tiddy is four the fifth towser the sixth tumbler which if in hand towsers five and tumbler six and so double if turned up and the king or queen of trumps is three now as there can neither more nor less than three persons play at this game who have twelve cards apiece dealt to them at four at a time you are to note that twenty-two are your cards if you win nothing but the cards that were dealt you you lose ten if you have neither tib tom tiddy king queen mournival nor gleek you lose because you count as many cards as you had in tricks which must be few by reason of the badness of your hand if you have tib tom king and qu 
queen of trumps in your hand you have thirty by honours that is eight above your own cards besides the cards you win by them in play if you have tom only which is nine and the king of trumps which is three then you reckon from twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen till you come to twenty-two and then every card wins so many pence groats or what else you played for and if you are under twenty-two you lose as many End of footnote. the gull groper who knows to half an acre all his means takes the gull when out of luck to a side window and in a whisper talks of dice being made of women's bones which would cousin any man but he pours his gold on the board and a bond is rapturously signed for the next quarter day but the gull groper by a variety of expedients avoids having the bond duly discharged he contrives to get a judgment and a sergeant with his mace procures the forfeiture of the bond the treble value but the impostor has none of the milkiness of the gall groper he looks for no favour under heaven from any man he is bluff with all the ordinary he spits at random jingles his spurs into any man's cloak and his humour is to be a devil of a dare-all all fear him as the tyrant they must obey the tender gull trembles and admires this roisterer's valour at length the devil he feared becomes his champion and the poor gull proud of his intimacy hides himself under this eagle's wings the impostor sits close by his elbow takes a partnership in his game furnishes the stakes when out of luck and in truth does not care how fast the gull loses for a twirl of his mustachio a tip of his nose or a wink of his eye drives all the losses of the gull into the profits of the grand confederacy at the ordinary and when the impostor has fought the gull's quarrels many a time at last he kicks up the table and the gull sinks himself into the class of the forlorn hope he lives at the mercy of his late friends the gall groper and the impostor who sent him out to lure some tender bird in feather such were the hells of our ancestors from which our worthies might take a lesson and the warren in which the audleys were the coney catchers but to return to our audley this philosophical usurer never pressed hard for his debts like the fowler he never shook his nets lest he might startle satisfied to have them without appearing to hold them with great fondness he compared his bonds to infants which battle best by sleeping to battle is to be nourished a term still retained at the university of oxford his familiar companions were all subordinate actors in the great piece he was performing he too had his part in the scene when not taken by surprise on his table usually lay open a great bible with bishop andrews's folio sermons which often gave him an opportunity of railing at the covetousness of the clergy declaring their religion was a mere preach and that the time would never be well till we had queen elizabeth's protestants again in fashion he was aware of all the evils arising out of a population beyond the means of subsistence and dreaded an inundation of men spreading like the spawn of cod hence he considered marriage with a modern political economist as very dangerous bitterly censuring the clergy whose children he said never thrived and whose widows were left destitute an apostolical life according to audley required only books meat and drink to be had for fifty pounds a year celibacy voluntary poverty and all the mortifications of a primitive christian were the virtues practised by this puritan among his money-bags yet audley's was that worldly wisdom which derives all its strength from the weaknesses of mankind everything was to be obtained by stratagem and it was his maxim that to grasp our object the faster we must go a little round about it his life is said to have been one of intricacies and mysteries using indirect means in all things but if he walked in a labyrinth it was to bewilder others for the clue was still in his own hand all he saw was that his design should not be discovered by his actions his word we are told was his bond 
his hour was punctual and his opinions were compressed and weighty but if he was true to his bond word it was only a part of the system to give facility to the carrying on of his trade for he was not strict to his honour the pride of victory as well as the passion for acquisition combined in the character of audley as in more tremendous conquerors his partners dreaded the effects of his law library and usually relinquished a claim rather than stand a latent suit against a quibble when one menaced him by showing some money-bags which he had resolved to empty in law against him audley then in office in the court of wards with a sarcastic grin asked whether the bags had any bottom i replied the exulting possessor striking them in that case i care not retorted the cynical officer of the court of wards for in this court i have a constant spring and i cannot spend in other courts more than i gain in this he had at once the meanness which would evade the law and the spirit which could resist it the genius of audley had crept out of the purlieus of guildhall and entered the temple and having often sauntered at pals down the great promenade which was reserved for duke humphrey and his guests he would turn into that part called the usurer's alley to talk with thirty in the hundred and at length was enabled to purchase his office at that remarkable institution the court of wards footnote a note to singer's edition of hall's satire says the phrase originated from the popular belief that the tomb of sir john beecham in old st paul's was that of humphrey duke of gloucester hence to walk about the isles dinnerless was termed dining with duke humphrey and a poem by speed termed the legend of his grace etc published sixteen seventy four details the popular idea nor doth the duke his invitation send to princes or to those that on them tend but pays his kindness to a hungry maw his charity his reason and his law for to say truth hunger hath hundreds brought to dine with him and all not worth a groat End of footnote. the entire fortunes of those whom we now call wards in chancery were in the hands and often submitted to the arts or the tyranny of the officers of this court when audley was asked the value of this new office he replied that it might be worth some thousands of pounds to him who after his death would instantly go to heaven twice as much to him who would go to purgatory and nobody knows what to him who would adventure to go to hell such was the pious casuistry of a witty usurer whether he undertook this last adventure for the four hundred thousand pounds he left behind him how can a sceptical biographer decide audley seems ever to have been weak when temptation was strong some saving qualities however were mixed with the vicious ones he liked best another passion divided dominion with the sovereign one audley's strongest impressions of character were cast in the old law library of his youth and the pride of legal reputation was not inferior in strength to the rage for money if in the court of wards he pounced on encumbrances which lay on estates and prowled about to discover the craving wants of their owners it appears that he also received liberal fees from the relatives of young heirs to protect them from the rapacity of some great persons but who could not certainly exceed oddly in subtlety he was an admirable lawyer for he was not satisfied with hearing but examining his clients which he called pinching the cause where he perceived it was foundered he made two observations on clients and lawyers which have not lost their poignancy many clients in telling their case rather plead than relate it so that the advocate heareth not the true state of it till opened by the adverse party some lawyers seem to keep an assurance office in their chambers and will warrant any cause brought unto them knowing that if they fail they lose nothing but what was lost long since their credit the career of audley's ambition closed with the extinction of the court of wards by which he incurred the loss of above one hundred thousand pounds on that occasion he observed that his ordinary losses were as the shavings of his beard which only grew the faster by them but the loss of this place was like the cutting off of a member which was irrecoverable 
the hoary usurer pined at the decline of his genius discoursed on the vanity of the world and hinted at retreat a facetious friend told him a story of an old rat who having acquainted the young rats that he would at length retire to his hole desiring none to come near him their curiosity after some days led them to venture to look into the hole and there they discovered the old rat sitting in the midst of a rich parmesan cheese the loss of the last one hundred thousand pounds may have disturbed his digestion for he did not long survive his court of wards such was this man converting wisdom into cunning invention into trickery and wit into cynicism engaged in no honourable cause he however showed a mind resolved making plain the crooked and involved path he trod sustine et abstine to bear and forbear was the great principle of epictetus and our moneyed stoic bore all the contempt and hatred of the living smilingly while he forbore all the consolations of our common nature to obtain his end he died in unblessed celibacy and thus he received the curses of the living for his rapine while the stranger who grasped the million he had raked together owed him no gratitude at his death End of section 33。section 34 of curiosities of literature volume 2。this is a librivox recording。all librivox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org。curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli。chidiock tichborne。i have already drawn a picture of jewish history in our country the present is a companion piece exhibiting a roman catholic one the domestic history of our country awakens our feelings far more than the public in the one we recognize ourselves as men in the other we are nothing but politicians the domestic history is indeed entirely involved in the fate of the public and our opinions are regulated according to the different countries and by the different ages we live in yet systems of politics and modes of faith are for the individual but the chance occurrences of human life usually found in the cradle and laid in the grave it is only the herd of mankind or their artful leaders who fight and curse one another with so much sincerity amidst these intestine struggles or perhaps when they have ceased and our hearts are calm we perceive the eternal force of nature acting on humanity then the heroic virtues and private sufferings of persons engaged in an opposite cause and acting on different principles than our own appeal to our sympathy and even excite our admiration a philosopher born a roman catholic assuredly could commemorate many a pathetic history of some heroic huguenot while we with the same feeling in our heart discover a romantic and chivalrous band of catholics chidiock tichborne is a name which appears in the conspiracy of anthony babington against elizabeth and the history of this accomplished young man may enter into the romance of real life having discovered two interesting domestic documents relative to him i am desirous of preserving a name and a character which have such claims on our sympathy there is an interesting historical novel entitled the jesuit whose story is founded on this conspiracy remarkable for being the production of a lady without if i recollect rightly a single adventure of love of the fourteen characters implicated in this conspiracy few were of the stamp of men ordinarily engaged in dark assassinations hume has told the story with his usual grace the fuller narrative may be found in camden but the tale may yet receive from the character of chidiock tichborne a more interesting close some youths worthy of ranking with the heroes rather than with the traitors of england had been practised on by the subtlety of ballard a disguised jesuit of great intrepidity and talents whom camden calls a silken priest in a soldier's habit for this versatile intriguer changed into all shapes and took up all names yet with all the arts of a political jesuit he found himself entrapped in the nets of that more crafty one 
the sub dolus walsingham ballard had opened himself to babington a catholic a youth of large fortune the graces of whose person were only inferior to those of his mind in his travels his generous temper had been touched by some confidential friends of the scottish mary and the youth susceptible of ambition had been recommended to that queen and an intercourse of letters took place which seemed as deeply tinctured with love as with loyalty the intimates of babington were youths of congenial tempers and studies and in their exalted imaginations they could only view in the imprisoned mary of scotland a sovereign a saint and a woman but friendship the most tender if not the most sublime ever recorded prevailed among this band of self-devoted victims and the damon and pythias of antiquity were here outnumbered but these conspirators were surely more adapted for lovers than for politicians the most romantic incidents are interwoven in this dark conspiracy some of the letters to mary were conveyed by a secret messenger really in the pay of walsingham others were lodged in a concealed place covered by a loosened stone in the wall of the queen's prison all were transcribed by walsingham before they reached mary even the spies of that singular statesman were the companions or the servants of the arch-conspirator ballard for the minister seems only to have humoured his taste in assisting him through this extravagant plot yet as if a plot of so loose a texture was not quite perilous enough the extraordinary incident of a picture representing the secret conspirators in person was probably considered as the highest stroke of political intrigue the accomplished babington had portrayed the conspirators himself standing in the midst of them that the imprisoned queen might thus have some kind of personal acquaintance with them there was at least as much of chivalry as of Mach machiavellism in this conspiracy this very picture before it was delivered to mary the subtle walsingham had copied to exhibit to elizabeth the faces of her secret enemies hubrocken in his portrait of walsingham has introduced in the vignette the incident of this picture being shown to elizabeth a circumstance happily characteristic of the genius of this crafty and vigilant statesman camden tells us that babington had first inscribed beneath the picture this verse he mihi sunt comites quos ipsa pericula ducent these are my companions whom the same dangers lead but as this verse was considered by some of less heated fancies as much too open and intelligible they put one more ambiguous quorsum haec alio properantibus what are these things to men hastening to another purpose this extraordinary collection of personages must have occasioned many alarms to elizabeth at the approach of any stranger till the conspiracy was suffered to be sufficiently matured to be ended once she perceived in her walks a conspirator and on that occasion erected her lion port reprimanding her captain of the guards loud enough to meet the conspirator's ear that he had not a man in his company who wore a sword am not i fairly guarded exclaimed elizabeth it is in the progress of the trial that the history and the feelings of these wondrous youths appear in those times when the government of the country yet felt itself unsettled and mercy did not sit in the judgment seat even one of the judges could not refrain from being affected at the presence of so gallant a band as the prisoners at the bar o oh, ballard ballard the judge exclaimed what hast thou done a sort a company of brave youths otherwise endued with good gifts by thy inducement hast thou brought to their utter destruction and confusion the jesuit himself commands our respect although we refuse him our esteem for he felt some compunction at the tragical executions which were to follow and wished all the blame might rest on him could the shedding of his blood be the saving of babington's life when this romantic band of friends were called on for their defence the most pathetic instances of domestic affection appeared one had engaged in this plot solely to try to save his friend 
for he had no hopes of it nor any wish for its success he had observed to his friend that the haughty and ambitious mind of anthony babington would be the destruction of himself and his friends nevertheless he was willing to die with them another to withdraw if possible one of those noble youths from the conspiracy although he had broken up housekeeping said to employ his own language i called back my servants again together and began to keep house again more freshly than ever i did only because i was weary to see tom salisbury straggling and willing to keep him about home having attempted to secrete his friend this gentleman observed i am condemned because i suffered salisbury to escape when i knew he was one of the conspirators my case is hard and lamentable either to betray my friend whom i love as myself and to discover tom salisbury the best man in my country of whom i only made choice or else to break my allegiance to my sovereign and to undo myself and my posterity for ever whatever the political casuist may determine on this case the social being carries his own manual in the heart the principle of the greatest of republics was to suffer nothing to exist in competition with its own ambition but the roman history is a history without fathers and brothers another of the conspirators replied for flying away with my friend i fulfil the part of a friend when the judge observed that to perform his friendship he had broken his allegiance to his sovereign he bowed his head and confessed therein i have offended another asked why he had fled into the woods where he was discovered among some of the conspirators proudly or tenderly replied for company when the sentence of condemnation had passed then broke forth among this noble band that spirit of honour which surely had never been witnessed at the bar among so many criminals their great minds seemed to have reconciled them to the most barbarous of deaths but as their estates as traitors might be forfeited to the queen their sole anxiety was now for their families and their creditors one in the most pathetic terms recommends to her majesty's protection a beloved wife another a destitute sister but not among the least urgent of these supplications was one that their creditors might not be injured by their untimely end the statement of their affairs is curious and simple if mercy be not to be had exclaimed one i beseech you my good lords this i owe some sums of money but not very much and i have more owing to me i beseech that my debts may be paid with that which is owing to me another prayed for a pardon the judge complimented him that he was one who might have done good service to his country but declares he cannot obtain it then said the prisoner i beseech that six angels which such an one hath of mine may be delivered to my brother to pay my debts how much are thy debts demanded the judge he answered the same six angels will discharge it that nothing might be wanting to complete the catastrophe of their sad story our sympathy must accompany them to their tragical end and to their last words these heroic yet affectionate youths had a trial there intolerable to their social feelings the terrific process of executing traitors was the remains of feudal barbarism and has only been abolished very recently i must not refrain from painting this scene of blood the duty of an historian must be severer than his taste and i record in a note a scene of this nature footnote let not the delicate female start from the revolting scene nor censure the writer since that writer is a woman suppressing her own agony as she supported on her lap the head of the miserable sufferer this account was drawn up by mrs elizabeth willoughby a catholic lady who amidst the horrid execution could still her own feelings in the attempt to soften those of the victim she was a heroine with a tender heart the subject was one of the executed jesuits hugh green who often went by the name of ferdinand brooks according to the custom of these people who disguised themselves by double names he suffered in sixteen forty two and this narrative is taken from the curious and scarce folios of dodd a roman catholic church history of england 
the hangman either through unskilfulness or for want of sufficient presence of mind had so ill performed his first duty of hanging him that when he was cut down he was perfectly sensible and able to sit upright upon the ground viewing the crowd that stood about him the person who undertook to quarter him was one barefoot a barber who being very timorous when he found he was to attack a living man it was near half an hour before the sufferer was rendered entirely insensible of pain the mob pulled at the rope and threw the jesuit on his back then the barber immediately fell to work ripped up his belly and laid the flaps of skin on both sides the poor gentleman being so present to himself as to make the sign of the cross with one hand during this operation mrs elizabeth willoughby the writer of this kneeled at the jesuit's head and held it fast beneath her hands his face was covered with a thick sweat the blood issued from his mouth ears and eyes and his forehead burnt with so much heat that she assures us she could scarce endure her hand upon it the barber was still under a great consternation but i stopped my pen amidst these circumstantial horrors End of footnote the present one was full of horrors Ballard was first executed and snatched alive from the gallows to be embowelled babington looked on with an undaunted countenance steadily gazing on that variety of tortures which he himself was in a moment to pass through the others averted their faces fervently praying when the executioner began his tremendous office on babington the spirit of this haughty and heroic man cried out amidst the agony parge se mihi domine jesu spare me lord jesus there were two days of execution it was on the first that the noblest of these youths suffered and the pity which such criminals had excited among the spectators evidently weakened the sense of their political crime the solemnity not the barbarity of the punishment affects the populace with right feelings elizabeth an enlightened politician commanded that on the second day the odious part of the sentence against traitors should not commence till after their death one of these generosi adolescentuli youths of generous blood was chidiac tichborne of southampton the more intimate friend of babington he had refused to connect himself with the assassination of elizabeth but his reluctant consent was inferred from his silence his address to the populace breathes all the carelessness of life in one who knew all its value proud of his ancient descent from a family which had existed before the conquest till now without a stain he paints the thoughtless happiness of his days with his beloved friend when any object rather than matters of state engaged their pursuits the hours of misery were only first known the day he entered into the conspiracy how feelingly he passes into the domestic scene amidst his wife his child and his sisters and even his servants well might he cry more in tenderness than in reproach friendship hath brought me to this countrymen and my dear friends you expect i should speak something i am a bad orator and my text is worse it were in vain to enter into the discourse of the whole matter for which i am brought hither for that it hath been revealed heretofore let me be a warning to all young gentlemen especially generosi adolescentulis i had a friend a dear friend of whom i made no small account whose friendship hath brought me to this he told me the whole matter i cannot deny as they had laid it down to be done but i always thought it impious and denied to be a dealer in it but the regard of my friend caused me to be a man in whom the old proverb was verified i was silent and so consented before this thing chanced we lived together in most nourishing estate of whom went report in the strand fleet street and elsewhere about london but of babington and tichborne no threshold was of force to brave our entry thus we lived and wanted nothing we could wish for and god knows what less in my head than matters of state now give me leave to declare the miseries i sustained after i was acquainted with the action wherein i may justly compare my estate to that of adams who could not abstain one thing forbidden to enjoy all other things the world could afford the terror of conscience awaited me 
after i considered the dangers whereinto i was fallen i went to sir john peters in essex and appointed my horses should meet me at london intending to go down into the country i came to london and then heard that all was bewrayed whereupon like adam we fled into the woods to hide ourselves my dear countrymen my sorrows may be your joy yet mix your smiles with tears and pity my case i am descended from a house from two hundred years before the conquest never stained till this my misfortune i have a wife and one child my wife agnes my dear wife and there's my grief and six sisters left in my hand my poor servants i know their master being taken were dispersed for all which i do most heartily grieve i expected some favour though i deserved nothing less that the remainder of my years might in some sort have recompensed my former guilt which seeing i have missed let me now meditate on the joys i hope to enjoy tichborne had addressed a letter to his dear wife agnes the night before he suffered which i discovered among the harleian manuscripts it overflows with the most natural feeling and contains some touches of expression all sweetness and tenderness which marked the shakespearean era the same manuscript has also preserved a more precious gem in a small poem composed at the same time which indicates his genius fertile in imagery and fraught with the melancholy philosophy of a fine and wounded spirit the unhappy close of the life of such a noble youth with all the prodigality of his feelings and the cultivation of his intellect may still excite that sympathy in the generosis ad adolescent tulis which chidiac tichborne would have felt for them a letter written by chidiac tichborne the night before he suffered death unto his wife dated of anno fifteen eighty six to the most loving wife alive i commend me unto her and desire god to bless her with all happiness pray for her dead husband and be of good comfort for i hope in jesus christ this morning to see the face of my maker and redeemer in the most joyful throne of his glorious kingdom commend me to all my friends and desire them to pray for me and in all charity to pardon me if i have offended them commend me to my six sisters poor desolate souls advise them to serve god for without him no goodness is to be expected were it possible my little sister bab the darling of my race might be bred by her god would reward her but i do her wrong i confess that hath by my desolate negligence too little for herself to add a further charge unto her dear wife forgive me that have by these means so much impoverished her fortunes patience and pardon good wife i crave make of these our necessities a virtue and lay no further burthen on my neck than hath already been there be certain debts that i owe and because i know not the order of the law piteous it hath taken from me all forfeited by my course of offence to her majesty i cannot advise thee to benefit me herein but if there fall out wherewithal let them be discharged for god's sake i will not that you trouble yourself with the performance of these matters my own heart but make it known to my uncles and desire them for the honour of god and ease of their soul to take care of them as they may and especially care of my sisters bringing up the burthen is now laid on them now sweet cheek what is left to bestow on thee a small jointure a small recompense for thy deserving these legacies following to be thine own god of his infinite goodness give thee grace always to remain his true and faithful servant that through the merits of his bitter and blessed passion thou mayest become in good time of his kingdom with the blessed women in heaven may the holy ghost comfort thee with all necessaries for the wealth of thy soul in the world to come where until it shall please almighty god i meet thee farewell loving wife farewell the dearest to me on all the earth farewell by the hand from the heart of thy most faithful loving husband chidiac tichborne verses made by chidiac tichborne of himself in the tower the night before he suffered death who was executed in lincoln's inn fields for treason in fifteen eighty six my prime of youth is but a frost of cares my feast of joy is but a dish of pain my crop of corn is but a field of tares and all my goods is but vain hope of gain the day is fled and yet i saw no sun and now i live and now my life is done my spring is past and yet it hath not sprung the fruit is dead and yet the leaves are green my youth is past and yet i am but young i saw the world and yet i was not seen 
my thread is cut and yet it is not spun and now i live and now my life is done i sought for death and found it in the womb i looked for life and yet it was a shade i trade the ground and knew it was my tomb and now i die and now i am but made the glass is full and yet my glass is run and now i live and now my life is done footnote this pathetic poem has been printed in one of the old editions of sir walter raleigh's poems but could never have been written by him in those times the collectors of the works of a celebrated writer would insert any fugitive pieces of merit and pass them under a name which was certain of securing the reader's favour the entire poem in every line echoes the feelings of chidiock tichborne who perished with all the blossoms of life and genius about him in the maytime of his existence End of footnote. End of section 34section thirty five of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli elizabeth and her parliament the year fifteen sixty six was a remarkable period in the domestic annals of our great elizabeth then for a moment broke forth a noble struggle between the freedom of the subject and the dignity of the sovereign one of the popular grievances of her glorious reign was the maiden state in which the queen persisted to live notwithstanding such frequent remonstrances and exhortations the nation in a moment might be thrown into the danger of a disputed succession and it became necessary to allay that ferment which existed among all parties while each was fixing on its own favourite hereafter to ascend the throne the birth of james i this year reanimated the partisans of mary of scotland and men of the most opposite parties in england unanimously joined in the popular cry for the marriage of elizabeth or a settlement of the succession this was a subject most painful to the thoughts of elizabeth she started from it with horror and she was practising every imaginable artifice to evade it the real cause of this repugnance has been passed over by our historians camden however hints at it when he places among other popular rumours of the day that men cursed huick the queen's physician for dissuading her from marriage for i know not what female infirmity the queen's physician thus incurred the odium of the nation for the integrity of his conduct he well knew how precious was her life footnote foreign authors who had an intercourse with the english court seem to have been better informed or at least found themselves under less restraint than our home writers in bail note ten the reader will find this mysterious affair cleared up and at length in one of our own writers whitaker in his mary queen of scots vindicated volume two page five hundred and two elizabeth's answer to the first address of the commons on her marriage in hume volume five page thirteen is now more intelligible he has preserved her fanciful style End of footnote. this fact once known throws a new light over her conduct the ambiguous expressions which she constantly employs when she alludes to her marriage in her speeches and in private conversations are no longer mysterious she was always declaring that she knew her subjects did not love her so little as to wish to bury her before her time even in the letter i shall now give we find this remarkable expression urging her to marriage she said was asking nothing less than wishing her to dig her grave before she was dead conscious of the danger of her life by marriage she had early declared when she ascended the throne that she would live and die a maiden queen but she afterwards discovered the political evil 
resulting from her unfortunate situation her conduct was admirable her great genius turned even her weakness into strength and proved how well she deserved the character which she had already obtained from an enlightened enemy the great sixtus v who observed of her chera un gran cervello di principessa she had a princely headpiece elizabeth allowed her ministers to pledge her royal word to the commons as often as they found necessary for her resolution to marry she kept all europe at her feet with the hopes and fears of her choice she gave ready encouragements perhaps allowed her agents to promote even invitations to the offers of marriage she received from crowned heads and all the coquetries and cajolings so often and so fully recorded with which she freely honoured individuals made her empire an empire of love where love however could never appear all these were merely political artifices to conceal her secret resolution which was not to marry at the birth of james the first as camden says the sharp and hot spirits broke out accusing the queen that she was neglecting her country and posterity all these humours observes hume broke out with great vehemence in a new session of parliament held after six prorogations the peers united with the commoners the queen had an empty exchequer and was at their mercy it was a moment of high ferment some of the boldest and some of the most british spirits were at work and they with the malice or wisdom of opposition combined the supply with the succession one was not to be had without the other this was a moment of great hope and anxiety with the french court they were flattering themselves that her reign was touching a crisis and la moth fenelon then the french ambassador at the court of elizabeth appears to have been busied in collecting hourly information of the warm debates in the commons and what passed in their interviews with the queen we may rather be astonished where he procured so much secret intelligence he sometimes complains that he is not able to acquire it as fast as catherine de medici and her son charles the ninth wished there must have been englishmen at our court who were serving as french spies in a private collection which consists of two or three hundred original letters of charles the ninth catherine de medici henry the third and mary of scotland etc i find two dispatches of this french ambassador entirely relating to the present occurrence what renders them more curious is that the debates on the question of the succession are imperfectly given in sir simon's dues journals the only resource open to us sir simons complains of the negligence of the clerk of the commons who indeed seems to have exerted his negligence whenever it was found most agreeable to the court party previous to the warm debates in the commons of which the present dispatch furnishes a lively picture on saturday twelfth october fifteen sixty six at a meeting of the lords of the council held in the queen's apartment the duke of norfolk in the name of the whole nobility addressed elizabeth urging her to settle the suspended points of the succession and of her marriage which had been promised in the last parliament the queen was greatly angered on the occasion she would not suffer their urgency on those points and spoke with great animation hitherto you have had no opportunity to complain of me i have well governed the country in peace and if a late war of little consequence has broken out which might have occasioned my subjects to complain of me with me it has not originated but with yourselves as truly i believe lay your hands on your hearts and blame yourselves in respect to the choice of the succession not one of ye shall have it that choice i reserve to myself alone i will not be buried while i am living as my sister was do i not well know how during the life of my sister every one hastened to me at hatfield i am at present inclined to see no such travellers nor desire on this your advice in any way footnote 
a curious trait of the neglect queen mary experienced whose life being considered very uncertain sent all the intriguers of a court to elizabeth the next heir although then in a kind of state imprisonment End of footnote. in regard to my marriage you may see enough that i am not distant from it and in what respects the welfare of the kingdom go each of you and do your own duty twenty seventh october fifteen sixty six sire by my last dispatch of the twenty first instant footnote this dispatch is a meagre account written before the ambassador obtained all the information the present letter displays the chief particulars i have preserved above End of footnote among other matters i informed your majesty of what was said on saturday the nineteenth as well in parliament as in the chamber of the queen respecting the circumstance of the succession to this crown since which i have learned other particulars which occurred a little before and which i will not now omit to relate before i mention what afterwards happened on wednesday the sixteenth of the present month the comptroller of the queen's household moved in the lower house of parliament footnote by sir simon's dues journal it appears that the french ambassador had mistaken the day wednesday the sixteenth for thursday the seventeenth of october the ambassador is afterwards right in the other dates the person who moved the house whom he calls le soin dic de la roigne was sir edward rogers comptroller of her majesty's household the motion was seconded by sir william cecil who entered more largely into the particulars of the queen's charges incurred in the defence of new haven in france the repairs of her navy and the irish war with o'neill in the present narrative we fully discover the spirit of the independent member and at its close that part of the secret history of elizabeth which so powerfully develops her majestic character End of footnote. where the deputies of towns and counties meet to obtain a subsidy footnote the original says un subside de quatre sols pour livre End of footnote taking into consideration among other things that the queen had emptied the exchequer as well in the late wars as in the maintenance of her ships at sea for the protection of her kingdom and her subjects and which expenditure has been so excessive that it could no further be supported without the aid of her good subjects whose duty it was to offer money to her majesty even before she required it in consideration that hitherto she had been to them a benignant and courteous mistress the comptroller having finished one of the deputies a country gentleman rose in reply he said that he saw no occasion nor any pressing necessity which ought to move her majesty to ask for money of her subjects and in regard to the wars which it was said had exhausted her treasury she had undertaken them for herself as she had thought proper not for the defence of her kingdom nor for the advantage of her subjects but there was one thing which seemed to him more urgent and far more necessary to examine concerning this campaign which was how the money raised by the late subsidy had been spent and that every one who had had the handling of it should produce their accounts that it might be known if the monies had been well or ill spent on this rises one named mr bash purveyor of the marine and also a member of the said parliament footnote this gentleman's name does not appear in sir simon's duse's journal m le moth fenelon has however the uncommon merit contrary to the custom of his nation of writing an english name somewhat recognizable for edward bash was one of the general surveyors of the victualling of the queen's ships fifteen seventy three as i find in the lansdowne manuscripts volume sixteen article sixty nine who shows that it was most necessary that the commons should vote the said subsidies to her majesty who had not only been at vast charges and was so daily to maintain a great number of ships but also in building new ones 
repeating what the comptroller of the household had said that they ought not to wait till the queen asked for supplies but should make a voluntary offer of their services another country gentleman rises and replies that the said bash had certainly his reasons to speak for the queen in the present case since a great deal of her majesty's monies for the providing of ships passed through his hands and the more he consumed the greater was his profit according to his notion there were but too many purveyors in this kingdom whose noses had grown so long that they stretched from london to the west footnote in the original il avoit le nez si long qu'il est en droit depuis londres jusqu'à au pays de west End of footnote it was certainly proper to know if all they levied by their commission for the present campaign was entirely employed to the queen's profit nothing further was debated on that day the friday following when the subject of the subsidy was renewed one of the gentlemen deputies showed that the queen having prayed for the last subsidy footnote this term is remarkable in the original le roin ayant m petre which in congrave's dictionary a contemporary work is explained by to get by prayer obtained by suit compassed by entreaty procured by request this significant expression conveys the real notion of this venerable whig before whiggism had received a denomination and formed a party End of footnote had promised and pledged her faith to her subjects that after that one she never more would raise a single penny on them and promised even to free them from the wine duty of which promise they ought to press for the performance adding that it was far more necessary for this kingdom to speak concerning an heir or successor to their crown and of her marriage than of a subsidy the next day which was saturday the nineteenth they all began with the exception of a single voice a loud outcry for the succession amidst these confused voices and cries one of the council prayed them to have a little patience and with time they should be satisfied but that at this moment other matters pressed it was necessary to satisfy the queen about a subsidy no no cried the deputies we are expressly charged not to grant anything until the queen resolvedly answers that which we now ask and we require you to inform her majesty of our intention which is such as we are commanded to by all the towns and subjects of this kingdom whose deputies we are we further require an act or acknowledgment of our having delivered this remonstrance that we may satisfy our respective towns and counties that we have performed our charge they alleged for an excuse that if they had omitted any part of this their heads would answer for it we shall see what will come of this footnote the french ambassador no doubt flattered himself and his master that all this parlance could only close in insurrection and civil war End of footnote. tuesday the twenty second the principal lords and the bishops of london york winchester and durham went together after dinner from the parliament to the queen whom they found in her private apartment there after those who were present had retired and they remained alone with her the great treasurer having the precedence in age spoke first in the name of all he opened by saying that the commons had required them to unite in one sentiment and agreement to solicit her majesty to give her answer as she had promised to appoint a successor to the crown declaring it was necessity that compelled them to urge this point that they might provide against the dangers which might happen to the kingdom if they continued without the security they asked this had been the custom of her royal predecessors to provide long beforehand for the succession to preserve the peace of the kingdom that the commons were all of one opinion and so resolved to settle the succession before they would speak about a subsidy or any other matter whatever that hitherto nothing but the most trivial discussions had passed in parliament and so great an assembly was only wasting their time and saw themselves entirely useless 
they however supplicated her majesty that she would be pleased to declare her will on this point or at once to put an end to the parliament so that every one might retire to his home the duke of norfolk then spoke and after him every one of the other lords according to his rank holding the same language in strict conformity with that of the great treasurer the queen returned no softer answer than she had on the preceding saturday to another party of the same company saying that the commons were very rebellious and that they had not dared to have attempted such things during the life of her father that it was not for them to impede her affairs and that it did not become a subject to compel the sovereign what they asked was nothing less than wishing her to dig her grave before she was dead addressing herself to the lords she said my lords do what you will as for myself i shall do nothing but according to my pleasure all the resolutions which you may make can have no force without my consent and authority besides what you desire is an affair of much too great importance to be declared to a knot of hair-brains footnote in the original a un tas de cervol si legere in the footnote i will take counsel with men who understand justice and the laws as i am deliberating to do i will choose half a dozen of the most able i can find in my kingdom for consultation and after having their advice i will then discover to you my will on this she dismissed them in great anger by this sire your majesty may perceive that this queen is every day trying new inventions to escape from this passage that is on fixing her marriage or the succession she thinks that the duke of norfolk is principally the cause of this insisting footnote the word in the original is insistance an expressive word as used by the french ambassador but which boyer in his dictionary doubts whether it be french although he gives a modern authority the present is much more ancient End of footnote. which one person and the other stand to and is so angry against him that if she can find any decent pretext to arrest him i think she will not fail to do it and he himself as i understand has already very little doubt of this footnote the duke of norfolk was without comparison the first subject in england and the qualities of his mind corresponded with his high station says hume he closed his career at length the victim of love and ambition in his attempt to marry the scottish mary so great and honourable a man could only be a criminal by halves and to such the scaffold and not the throne is reserved when they engage in enterprises which by their secrecy in the eyes of a jealous sovereign assume the form and the guilt of a conspiracy End of footnote the duke told the earl of northumberland that the queen remained steadfast to her own opinion and would take no other advice than her own and would do everything herself the storms in our parliament do not necessarily end in political shipwrecks whenever the head of the government is an elizabeth she indeed sent down a prohibition to the house from all debate on the subject but when she discovered a spirit in the commons and language as bold as her own royal style she knew how to revoke the exasperating prohibition she even charmed them by the manner for the commons returned her prayers and thanks and accompanied them with a subsidy her majesty found by experience that the present like other passions was more easily calmed and quieted by following than resisting observes sir simon's dues the wisdom of elizabeth however did not weaken her intrepidity the struggle was glorious for both parties but how she escaped through the storm which her mysterious conduct had at once raised and quelled the sweetness and the sharpness the commendation and the reprimand of her noble speech in closing the parliament are told by hume with the usual felicity of his narrative End of section 35